Hello and welcome to my Saturday for Patrons uh, video. So this video comes at the end of the week that we read Acts 23. Acts 23 has that curious verse about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and their belief in the afterlife. It says, for the uh, Pharisees believe in, for the Sadducees do not believe in resurrection, neither spirit nor angel, but the Pharisees confess both. And it sounds like it's talking about two different views of resurrection, a spirit resurrection and some kind of an angelic resurrection. Um, my sense is, is that perhaps in circles that believed in afterlife, that they had two different kind of basic trajectories, one of which saw the afterlife as more embodied, uh, embodied, so that would be like angelic resurrection, and the other of which saw resurrection as more spiritual uh, in nature. Of course, we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul clearly had an embodiment sense. Now, Paul never talks about angelic resurrection. He doesn't, never says that. But I wonder if in the, in the language of Acts, uh, if, um, if Luke would have described the kind of resurrection that Paul espouses in 1 Corinthians 15 as a kind of angel embodied form of resurrection. The other kind of resurrection uh, would be then spirit resurrection. Now, um, my sense is, is that Acts is not using the language that I use or the language that most people use today when they talk about the afterlife. Um, and um, I mentioned in that, in the particular podcast and video uh, relating to that verse, that N.T. Wright um, suspects that this is a conversation about intermediate state. Um, I really don't know what, um, what the state of the discussion was at the time of Luke uh, when he was writing Acts. Um, and so it, it seems like it's possible, at least, that, that Luke blurs some things together. Um, so what I want to do in this video is I want to do, uh, bring to bear some research that I've done in the past on Jewish views of the afterlife and kind of sketch out what I see as four basic positions that various Jews had held at one point or another. I do think there, there could be a, a rough developmental scheme over, over a period of, of two or three centuries uh, in which there was a kind of a gradual movement among Jews from one position um, to another. I would say that by, by the year 100, which of course is not too long after Luke would have been written, I would say that perhaps by the year 100, there was a kind of coalescing of Jewish views on the afterlife to where there became a kind of orthodoxy about the afterlife, um, certainly that we find in the book of, uh, in the Mishnah, uh, there's a treatise called Sanhedrin, uh, chapter 10, uh, 10 uh, the 10th section, where it says, all Israel have a part in the life to come. And my guess is, is that by that time, uh, by, by the 100, 200 AD, Jews had, a, had a, what I'm calling the fourth view, which is a full embodiment to the earth, restored earth, new earth uh, kind of view of resurrection. And I think that's the view that Luke has uh, of resurrection, and I believe that's Christian orthodoxy. Uh, that, that, that Christian orthodoxy and what became Jewish orthodoxy here basically says, yes, you die, you're conscious in your death, uh, but there will be a time of resurrection in the future in which you will be re-embodied um, in an improved body, probably, uh, and that there will be a new earth and uh, basically justice will be dispensed and there will be eternal life on a renewed earth. That seems to me to be the, the Orthodox Christian view and the, the Orthodox uh, Jewish view. However, it was not always the case. This developed. And of course, if you have faith in those sorts of, of creeds and such, uh, orthodoxies, then you, you, you can believe that, that God was leading, you know, leading the, the, this particular trajectory along. Um, well, okay, let's go ahead. The four views as I have outlined them are, first of all, there were certainly Jews who had no sense of any kind of personal or meaningful afterlife. You might be surprised uh, to find out that this is the position of the vast majority of the Old Testament. Um, there is very little in the Old Testament about an afterlife. 
Uh, Sheol in the Old Testament is the realm of all the dead, just like Hades in Greek. It doesn't distinguish reward or punishment. It just is simply a, a somewhat, I assume, metaphorical, although some may have taken it literally, uh, re reference to where the dead go. Um, and this would seem to largely be a mindless um, kind of place, as we find in Greek literature, uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey, uh, an Iliad, uh, for example. Um, okay, so no meaningful life, afterlife for most of the Old Testament, although there is Daniel. Daniel 12, 2 and 3 is our go-to verse in the Old Testament on the afterlife. So in that sense, the Sadducees, the Sadducees really weren't the ones who were liberal in a way. Uh, at least on this issue, the Sadducees were more conservative in terms of retaining what seemed to have been the past position within Judaism. And the Pharisees were the new, kind of the new belief when it came to the afterlife. Um, we could debate these things. I'm, I'm quite willing to be shown the error of my ways. But this, I think, is probably what most Old Testament scholars would say. Um, so at some point... And I wonder if under, under Greek influence, perhaps, uh, and of course, perhaps the Greeks got it from the Persians, I, I don't know, but it would seem that um, we see somewhere around 200 BC, um, and then stretching into, like, a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls were probably written about 100 BC, I would guess, a sense of disembodied afterlife. This is actually what a lot of Christians believe. A lot of Christians believe you die and you go to heaven or hell. And, uh, of course, uh, in terms of intermediate state, that, that is a fairly Christian view that you die and you either go to a place of reward or, or, or punishment. Um, but, of course, Christians believe in an event called resurrection that is yet to come. Um, but uh, sometimes we associate this idea of you die and you go to reward or covenant with, with kind of Greek immortality of the soul. You know, the idea that you have a soul, and then when you die, your soul goes, goes somewhere. Uh, that's, that's probably a gross oversimplification. First of all, that's not, again, the Christian perspective is resurrection. The Christian perspective is bodily resurrection. And in fact, the historic, the, the, the majority of the biblical texts, and I guess historic Christianity, it's resurrection to the earth, to a new earth. I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with you die, you go to heaven or hell. I, we didn't really... You know, there wasn't a real clear sense of what the resurrection was. I'm sure we believed in the resurrection growing up, but but how we integrated that with dying, go to heaven or hell, I'm not sure that we did a, a good, we didn't see the connection there. Um, yes, uh, we die and we go to reward or punishment um, in keeping with the second view, but Christians and Jews believe that there will be an event of resurrection in which we will be uh, embodied in an improved way um, and it'll be on the earth. So, so there was a stage of Jewish uh, belief uh, where um, there was a sense of you die and you go to reward or punishment, and there, there doesn't seem to be as much talk about resurrection in some literature. I would date this literature to, you know, the first century BC, the second century BC. Um, a period, you see the transition? We've gone from no real meaningful afterlife to afterlife, positive or negative. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls may have this view, maybe, um, although we'll see a quote, we'll see some, uh, some quotes uh, later on in this video put them in the third category. Uh, but like Philo, the Jewish philosopher, um, who was, you know, more Greekified, more Hellenized. Um, so this, this is the second view. Then this is, this is kind of surprising, I think. But I think we can discern, and I, of course, took this from uh, John Collins, I think, in a book uh, called Apocalypticism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. This book, Apocalypticism and the Dead Sea Scrolls by John Collins, John J. Collins, um, was um, formative in my thinking on this category. Uh, but it would seem that there are some texts in which, yes, you die and you, well, I don't know what happens when you die exactly. These are muddy texts to me. I haven't fully sorted out what I think, but the, there is a resurrection. There is a point. There is a there is a day of visitation. There is a judgment day, but it's not it's not clear in those texts that those who are blessed come back to the earth. It's kind of like, and this might be close to what 
what I grew up with, really. You die, you go to heaven or hell, but there is a day of judgment in which there's a more permanent uh, uh, you know, place assignment. Um, and uh, there seems to be some kind of a heavenly destination for the blessed uh, in this, you know, in this um, category. And then, of course, there's what, what I've called the orthodox position, which is a, this bot, a resurrection to this earth um, with a new and improved uh, resurrection body. Okay, so those are the four views, as I understand it. And you can roughly see, you can roughly see the development. So if, if, if we were to beam back to the 4th century B.C., um, or the 5th century B.C., uh, perhaps, perhaps when, the, um, when the Psalms are being put into something like their current form, uh, when the writings, the last parts of the Old Testament, Job, Ecclesiastes, I don't know the exact dates of these things, uh, but when, when the writings are, are in their formative, final formative stage, you don't have a real sense of resurrection much, much there. And then with the Greek influence, perhaps, from the late uh, uh, fourth century on, you begin to see kind of this, you die and you go to a place of reward or punishment. By the way, that's, a, that's an oversimplified uh, view of, of Greek afterlife. Greek uh, views of the afterlife weren't monolithic. Even Plato uh, seems to, um, to have a, a sense that maybe not all, uh, maybe not everybody gets to go to a great place uh, in some of his writings. And so, and then in the, in the second century BC, uh, first century BC, we begin to see this idea of a day of visitation, that there will be a moment of judgment, and then there will be, yes, there'll be some movement in location in the afterlife, um, but, but there will be a kind of, uh, kind of uh, day of visitation, uh, but not necessarily to this earth. And then um, from second Maccabees, which is about 100 BC, we begin to see this sense of, of new creation, of a new earth, um, and resurrection to the earth. Okay, let's see. Here's some, so here are some, some texts to go along with what I'm saying. So if you read these texts from Psalm, or if you read these texts from Job, or if you read these texts from Ecclesiastes, it's, if you're honest, okay, if you're, if you're really exegeting, not reading into the text, if you really want to know what does the text seem to say, if you actually let the text speak, these texts really don't seem to have any, they, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any awareness of a conscious afterlife uh, in these texts. Now, uh, I put 19, uh, Job 19.25 there. We know it from Handel's Messiah. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand upon the earth. Um, you know, that in my flesh, uh, though the worm should eat my body, yet um, in my flesh shall I see God. The worm, I don't think Job actually mentions a worm. But this, of course, is associated with belief in resurrection. Even though my body is decaying, I know that my Redeemer lives, Jesus, and I will be resurrected in the latter days. Now, the thing is, if you look at the weight of Job's theology, look at all these verses. Um, you wonder if this is an example of reading True things again. I I love Handel's Messiah, and I'm, I I believe in fuller senses to text to where the Spirit makes them come alive in ways. Uh, that interpretation of Job nineteen is is a true. It's a truth. Uh, the question is whether that's what was in the bubble above Job's head, and I think the weight of other verses in Job suggests that that if there were another interpretation, it probably would be more likely to be original, and so. I think there is. I know that my Redeemer lives, God, and that in the latter days, that is, in the latter days of my life, uh, sometime later in my life, in my flesh I will see God. In other words, God's going to heal me. Even though right now I've got these boils and stuff, I believe that God is going to redeem me from this situation. He's going to heal my body, and that in my flesh I will see God. God will show up, and I will, and of course it happens, right? That's how the book of Job ends. Um, and so it seems to me that that interpretation um, is much more likely given the general thrust of other passages in Job. Okay, and of course, Ecclesiastes, you know, a, a live dog is better than a dead lion, you know. Um, there are several passages here. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is there isn't a large sense um, in these 
writings that I, I would say that these writings probably were were collected into something like their current form um, after the exile. I'm not denying that David wrote Psalms or, or that Solomon wrote Proverbs, or, or I'm not denying any of that. I'm just saying that these books are in the writings, and the writings seems to be the last part of the Old Testament to, to be collected, um, and it suggests, suggests to me a post-exilic kind of context for these. So, um, there is a, there is a very little awareness of a personal afterlife in in these texts. Now, of course, there are some possibles. Ezekiel thirty seven, can these dry bones live? Isaiah twenty six talks about resurrection. Um, again, I think probably this is us using our later Christian awareness of resurrection um, and reading into what was very metaphorical. Uh, in in the original texts here, um, and uh, probably more corporate. So Ezekiel 37, I don't think, is about individual resurrection, although it's natural for us as Western individualists to read it that way. I think Ezekiel 37 is about the the restoration of Israel as a people, not about the resurrection of individual uh, Israelites, but the resurrection of the people of, of Israel. I, again, um, there's room for disagreement, but uh, to I, I personally don't think there is a lot of debate to be had here. We, we may have a lot of debate, but if you're honest, I don't consider these interpretations really that ambiguous. But again, everybody thinks that about their own conclusions. Um, I just, I really, th I really think that if you're honest with the text, this is what it says. Um, the exception in the Old Testament is, of course, Daniel 12, 2 and 3, which I'll talk about in a second. So, um, Sirach, uh, Sirach written, um, this is in the Apocrypha, it's in the Roman Catholic Old Testament, Greek Orthodox Old Testament. Um, Sirach uh, was probably written uh, in its first draft in Hebrew uh, in the second century BC, uh, but it's put in its current Greek form, I think, in the late first century uh, BC, uh, late second century BC, around 100. Um, but anyway, clear here. Uh, there's no belief in resurrection in Sirach. Uh, and the Sadducees are clearly the heir to these positions. And um, they're strongly condemned in, uh, second, in, in the Mishnah in Sanhedrin 10. Uh, they're pretty much condemned for not believing uh, in, in any kind of afterlife. So this is the, the oldest strand of Jewish thinking on uh, the afterlife, in my, my opinion. Of course, there is, of course... Uh, the witch of Endor door brings uh, Samuel back from the dead. There, there are prohibitions against necromancy, a necromancy uh, in the Old Testament. So obviously there was a sense of, of the dead kind of being available, um, but that was a definite no-no of engaging, engaging the dead in any way. Uh, it's interesting in the, in the Odyssey, um, Odysseus has to give the mindless spirit of the prophet Tiresias, he gives him blood so that he can think. He's just a mindless shade, shadow, until uh, Odysseus gives him blood in the Odyssey, and then Tiresias can, can think again. Well, okay, so there's the Old Testament default. So what about this idea of you die, you go to heaven or hell? Um, so this seems to be present in, for example, Philo, uh, who is uh, clearly a very Hellenized version of Judaism. The wise have obtained the heavenly and celestial country, the wicked uh, dark recesses of hell. No good man ever dies. They will live forever and ever. Um, so uh, Philo doesn't have much of a sense of resurrection, if any. I think we would say he doesn't have a sense of resurrection. But he does have a sense of reward and punishment in the afterlife. Here's four Maccabees, also probably first century A.D., uh, the danger of eternal torment lies before those who transgress, but for those who are godly, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will welcome us. So again, there's this sense of you die, you go to reward or punishment in the afterlife. So that's the second perspective, kind of a transitional phase, heavily Greek influence, perhaps. So the, here's, the, here's the one that might be surprising to you. This idea that, at, at, especially in the, in the two centuries before Christ, uh, that there was a strand of Judaism that um, uh, did, they, one of all, first of all, they did believe in reward and punishment after death, 
but they also believed in a day of visitation where there would be kind of, uh, it would seal the deal, that those who were going to reward would, bam, they would really move on to reward, and those that weren't would either be abom uh, annihilated uh, or, or basically punished. Um, uh, I think it's kind of a little, a little un, it's, not, it's not a hard and fast position necessarily. But this is uh, the way I currently take Daniel. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will wake. Notice not everybody. It doesn't say everybody will. It says multitudes. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Then those who are wise will shine like the bright brightness of heavens, like the stars forever. Of course, um, uh, the position that this is talking about, some kind of a, a heavenly uh, destination, has been criticized by N.T. Wright and others. Um, although it seems possible here that this is talking about some kind of a, a heavenly destination uh, after an event of resurrection. Um, for Scenic 22, perhaps dates to, I don't know, 200 BC, the dead seem to be separated into four hollows. Um, the two that didn't receive justice in this world, it seems like, have a day of, re of, of visitation. So those who were bad but were never punished in this world and those who were good but suffered in this world, it seems like both of those groups get to uh, be a, so a justice administered in some way um, so that the justice can be done. Um, Pistol of Enoch, which dates probably to the first century BC, uh, the souls of the pious will come to life, their spirits will not perish. So this doesn't seem to be resurrection of the earth. It seems to be some kind of a spiritual resurrection uh, now you will shine like the luminaries of heaven. You'll shine. The portals of heaven will be open for you. You have great joy like the angels of heaven. You'll be companions of the host heaven. Is this angel re resurrection? Um, I don't know. But, but again, it seems to fit in a third kind of category. And if you look up these uh, Dead Sea Scroll uh, references, uh, which probably Dead Sea Scrolls probably um, scenes, um, uh, suggest that, uh, again, this kind of a schema that you die, you have you either sleep for a while or you have kind of an afterlife reward or punishment, but there's a day of judgment that will come in which there'll be a permanent assignment uh, in, and the permanent assignment of the righteous will be somewhere in the heavens. Okay, so finally we get to the orthodoxy. This is where it all seems to be headed. And of course, uh, as a, from a Christian perspective, we can say this is where God was leading the process, that God was leading this process of development of understanding toward what, what is Christian and now Jewish orthodoxy as well, namely a belief in a bodily resurrection to a new earth. So 2 Maccabees, of course, is very physical and possibly written by a Pharisee. So here's one of seven brothers, the Maccabean martyrs. Uh, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands and said nobly, I got these from heaven and I'm going to get them back again. So a very physical sense of resurrection. Here's another guy trying to commit suicide and failing, a, night, a guy named Razis. With his blood now completely drained from him, he tore out his entrails, took them with both hands, and hurled them at the crowd, throwing his intestines to the crowd, calling on the Lord of life to give him back to him again. So a resurrection body includes intestines, apparently, for Razis here. Uh, of course, the Pharisees believed in bodily resurrection. There's the standard um, reference in Josephus and the Antiquities. Uh, to these Jewish groups. And uh, Gen Genesis Rabbah uh, also um, talks about the School of Hillel's view of resurrection, and, and it's definitely an embodied kind of resurrection. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 has this sense of embodied resurrection too, although he doesn't see it as a, a fleshly body uh, of the sort we have now. It's a, it's a paper cut proof body. He doesn't say that. Uh, but our resurrection bodies are clear uh, glorified upgrade of our current body. But um, you also have in like Luke 24 and John 20, you know, Jesus has, you can actually see the nail prints um, uh, in, in his hands and, his, and the spear wound in his side. So Jesus' resurrection body at least has the marks of his previous body in, in John 20, I guess it is. And, um, and Luke 24, he eats with them to show them he's not a ghost. Well, there you have it. Um, a quick run through of uh, some of the um, afterlife traditions within Judaism, uh, moving on a trajectory toward 
what I think is now what Christians believe, which is resurrection, bodily resurrection to a new earth. Okay, well, there you have it. Four afterlife traditions within Judaism.